During the pandemic, KTV bars were ordered to close, but many adult-only outlets found ways to operate illegally. From in front, it looks like it's closed, but it's fully operational on the inside. Underground KTVs operates all around Singapore, even HDV. So what's going on inside these secretive establishments? You go KTV, there's someone hugging you, telling you, don't worry, next time will be better. We can't stand to be lonely. How far do they go to avoid being caught? We have the Telegram chats. If anyone were to get caught, they can easily just create a new user and carry on. Why does KTV lounge culture persist? Undercover Asia looks behind the closed doors of Singapore's adult-only KTV lounges. First place, we're going to Orchard, mm. Tanding side. Lah. Then oh, after that, Jalan Besar. Okay, Jalan Besar, wow, really too many. Before the pandemic, taxi driver Michael worked the night shift for two years. He knew where to pick up late night revelers leaving KTV bars because he'd been a regular KTV customer himself for almost 20 years. This is the famous Supreme KDB. This KDB, most Singaporean has been to, ranging from very young to quite old. Not surprising to see army boys and then to like those coffee shop and club. In the town area, that means covering from Tanling all the way until like Bukis, right? We might have at least around 30 KDBs. Michael noticed the number of KTV bars surge in Singapore some 20 years ago. Just this road on the two side, right? Easily more than 30. The big one, the small one. Um, this building on the left, upstairs. Yeah, the signage is still there. The craziest I heard, they tell me that this KTV outlet, right, there's 13 nationality ladies there. All the Lambo, you know, all the Bentley, Ferrari, they will be parking downstairs. Now we have like 158 empty lots. Before, I think not even a single lot. In 2019, it's estimated there were at least 600 KTVs operating in Singapore. Singapore's alert for the novel coronavirus has been raised to the second highest level. Workplaces across Singapore have shut as the country begins what's being called a circuit breaker. As it did with most businesses, the circuit breaker also shuttered all KTVs. 10,000 local workers, including waitresses, bar staff and bouncers, were left unemployed. But even as circuit breaker measures ease in June, KTVs, along with all other night spots, had to remain closed. Half a year into the shutdown, the government announces that night spots are still a high risk, dashing all hopes that KTVs will reopen soon. The following month, Authorities roll out a scheme to help night spots pivot. Some KTVs finally reopen. But as F&B outlets, singing is still banned. And so are hostesses, for fear they would spread COVID-19. But in July 2021... Worries mount over the emerging KTV cluster. 
potentially huge. That's how Health Minister Ong Yi Kang described the fast-growing COVID-19 cluster. Our strong suspicion is that mass of activities have occurred uh, in these uh, contexts. And the struggling KTV industry was dealt another hammer blow. On July 12th, 2021, a cluster of three cases linked to hostesses at three KTV outlets were recorded. And within days... 120 cases have been linked to KTV lounges, making this the night's top stories. Daily COVID-19 infections soar to a 10-month high. Caught in the eye of the storm was Denise. She came to Singapore to work as a hostess. She shared with Project X, a non-profit helping sex workers, that authorities came knocking just over a week after the KTV outbreak. I was about to go to the door. But because it was backing so hard, I panicked. I thought it was a robbery, so I quickly ran into my bedroom. I didn't know who they were because they were wearing plain clothes. They kept asking me where my passport was. I said I was traveling and living with my boyfriend. Denise says the police found her text history with her mama-san on her phone. In those text messages were instructions for hostess gigs for Denise. Denise was arrested for working illegally. The raid was part of enforcement checks on some 27 KTV outlets and other vice-related activities conducted in the wake of the outbreak. The police came down hard on KTV bars, illegally offering singing and hostessing activities that were banned due to the high risk of COVID-19 transmission. These raids cast a spotlight on a long-tolerated and deeply entrenched industry. In many parts of Southeast Asia, karaoke or KTV has two faces. One more wholesome experience is where friends and family come together to sing. This is called family-style karaoke. The other is what's called KTV bars, or commercial KTVs, and they are strictly for adults only. If a KTV got hostage services, it's considered a commercial one. The market needs for commercial KTVs in Singapore market is much bigger than family concept karaoke. The origin of adult-only KTV bars dates back four decades. In the China of the late 1980s, singing mostly took place in banquet halls. That changed when China opened its first commercial KTV bar, thanks to a Japanese businessman. The Japanese were trying to break into the emerging Chinese market. Their strategy was to woo Chinese officials with luxurious karaoke bars. It was 1980s. A lot of the Chinese officials make meager salary. They invited the Chinese officials into the karaoke bars and formed relationships with them. The official seal, which is green light for the Japanese products to flow into Chinese market in large quantities. The key dynamic is that women were hired to serve the man uh, in the karaoke bars. The women hired are commonly known as hostesses. They are not just waitresses. They are paid companions who drink and talk to male customers. Cheng worked as a karaoke hostess in a Chinese port city for two years. She wanted to study the nuances of this emerging Asian business dynamic for her PhD field research. A lot of activities involved in the lines between businessmen and officials is in the gray area of the law. So if one member, say, was interrogated by the police, they don't want that member to be able to just break down and tell the police about everybody else. 
With the stakes so high, Japanese businessmen use these KTV encounters as a pressure test. If a man just falls in head and heel over a woman just because she's so beautiful, that man would be seen as too emotional. And that kind of man would be easily break down and tell the police everything. The practice of relying on female entertainers to help facilitate business deals echoes both the Japanese geisha and Chinese courtesan culture. As Asian businesses grew, KTV hostess culture spread across the region and became an accepted practice in Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, China, and Singapore. Singapore's first commercial KTV bar reportedly opened in Orchard Towers in the mid-1980s, also by a Japanese businessman. Over the next few decades, KTV bars flourished in Singapore. They became a new way for men to conduct discreet business deals and size up the competition. When I bring him to such place, actually it's a test we can know this person can trust, cannot trust, or only just play. I get you drunk, your natural self actually comes out. But some people, even at the drunk stage, they can hold themselves, that is real control. In business, uh, they can succeed, because self-control is there. At the heart of this business are the girls, also known as the KTV hostesses. KTVs are not brothels. Although some hostesses may choose to offer sex in exchange for money to the men they favor. But any such off-shift encounters take place outside the karaoke room. At high-end Singapore KTVs, Hostesses are greatly valued for their companionship. You cannot do any hanky-panky thing. As for the girl, uh, chatting with somebody who is really rich, uh, it's not easy. So all these girls, they are really smart. Right? You talk to him, make him feel very comfortable. I clinch the deal. Your tips will be $2,000 instead of $600. So that is the high-end game that they are playing. Michael has witnessed KTV high rollers in action, splurging tens of thousands in a single night on the room, drinks and hostess tips, all to impress their business partners. If you're talking about people who is in the oil and gas industry, in the building material supply industry, they are talking about millions of dollars contract. Why is 10,000? A handful of high-rolling KTVs dominated the Singapore industry in the early 1990s. Soon, lower-end KTV bars emerged, catering to the masses, including a younger crowd looking for hard action. We are so into sex, we are so hyper. So in camp, nothing to do, five days discussing, we can book out nowhere. After news of Singapore's KTV COVID cluster broke in July 2021, the men frequenting these bars became a national joke, an image they resented. It's not just an uh, establishment for shady characters to hang out in, you know? Normal people, the neighbour next door, the office worker that they transport in the bus, they work a full-time job and once every weekend, they, they want to go somewhere to relax. So what is the appeal of KTV bars in Singapore? 
and is what happens inside as controversial as many imagine. Undercover Asia spoke to three KTV regulars. A common KTV origin story they all share is national service. I got my first paycheck from NS and that was the first time that I saw a four-digit sum on my bank account and I was overwhelmed, you know. I didn't know how to spend that money. We are so into sex, we are so hyper. So in camp, nothing to do, five days, keep discussing, we can book out, go where. You must have that one fellow that has already been to such places, know the ropes. Paid goals, yeah, KTV. Easy. Definitely you can get one, even if you are not handsome. All I have to do is and that differentiates KTVs from other forms of nightlife entertainment. You wouldn't just go up to a woman and outright talk to her or even touch her. Perhaps some people do, but it's not as normalised as you would in a KTV setting. They all just line up along the walls and then, you know, the guys just make the picket. <laughs> we have drinks, we play games, we sing. <laughs> all of this shrouded over intoxication. In spite of the hedonistic atmosphere of alcohol and beautiful girls, KTVs have strict rules and are run like clockwork. Hostesses are disciplined timekeepers and they will butterfly in clubs. This means each hostess visits multiple rooms in one night, spending just 15 minutes with each customer at any one time. And what they do with this time depends on the type of KTV bar the hostess operates in. There are certain unwritten rules. For example, for some KTV is somewhat more conservative. The girls that have a lower marking rate will usually just be there to have conversation with you. KTV customers pay hostesses tips to sit with them. At low-end KTVs, where women only drink with you, the tip is around $30. Most probably because of their age. Second, maybe they are married. They listen to your complaint and then maximum what you can do, ask them for a supper. After that, bye-bye. At the high end, Women who drink and socialize with business clients can expect to make around $500 to $600 per tip. The amount of money the hostess can make is also pegged to her age. Usually at all these high-end ones, the girls cross 23 years old. Uh, please, next. If you still look good, dress good, maybe you can maximum stay until 25. Then you drop tier, you go to the second level third level slowly drop. So that is so-called uh, unwritten rule. At mid-tier KTVs, the typical market rate for a tip is $50. And what does $50 get a customer? Different places have different limits or playability. Playability is simply put what the KTV hostess is willing to do with you. Where exactly are you allowed to touch? Can you kiss? Can you pet her? Can you do even more risky things with her within the confines of the KTV? It's like a paid date of sorts. First, you start with some toast, you sweet talk to the girl, and then when alcohol makes everything loosen up, 
nearing to the end of the session, that's where the lady will ask you the golden question. Do you want to go somewhere more intimate? What excites men when they go to KTVs is that they don't know whether they will be able to bring the hostess to the hotel room at the end of the session. She might have six or seven people eyeing for her to match. Who she go with? All will be paying her the same price, you know. Definitely she choose the one that she have better feelings with. Right? If really men goes to KTV to look for sex, I think better to camp in Geylang and not to aim these people in KTV. People always think well, it must all be about the sex. Actually, when you talk to people in the nightlife industries, the most taxing part of the work is the having to engage in the conversation to make sure that the client is not bored, but also you have to be a good listener. When your heart is broken, uh, who you like to talk to? Same gender or opposite sex? Most of the time, we look for opposite sex. We go KDB, have someone hugging you, telling you, don't worry, next time will be better. Michael met his wife for four years at a KTV after his first marriage ended in divorce. I feel that the girl that I talked to on the first night, quite comfortable. So maybe about four or five times, I say like, should we go hotel? She just tell me one thing. She's here to earn money. She drink, she play, she chat, but she don't do that. Eventually, she tell me that uh, you can meet me if we go supper. But don't keep coming here. Waste money. But I start to be open. I share with her my stories. Then that's how we get closer. Lah. Let's face it. Humans are social beings. Men always need a company of a woman. Not everyone is going to be handsome. Not every man is going to be charismatic or rich. Where are you going to fill their void? They need an avenue where they can find another half who's willing to sit with him for extended periods of time. We can't stand to be lonely. There are no official figures on the size of the adult-only KTV lounge sector in Singapore. Some insiders estimate at least 3,000 hostesses were employed in the sector before the pandemic. It's an industry that's shrouded in secrecy, but there are some clues to how it's run. For most KTVs, definitely financially, there'll be someone on the very top. Even, I think, the boss who runs this KTV doesn't know who this real boss is. The company definitely is Singaporean have to open it. The managers mostly are Singaporeans, followed by mummies. Mummies or mamasans are freelancers, and each manages 10 to 15 hostesses. We see Singapore girls, followed by Malaysian, after that China, Vietnam. Just before COVID, I see Cambodia. <laughs> For hostesses in mid-tier KTVs, <laughs> One night can bring in $300 worth of tips, but it's work that comes at a heavy price. Wendy's Singaporean husband died four years ago, and she was left to bring up their two children alone. With little money and few job prospects, Wendy turned to work as a KTV hostess. Tao Wendy's a permanent resident 
who's lived in Singapore for 15 years. She met her husband in Vietnam and followed him back to Singapore. He was estranged from his family and his death left Wendy stranded. The pandemic only made things worse. When newly pivoted KTVs opened as F&B outlets in November 2020, Wendy returned to hostessing, although it was now illegal. Pivoted KTVs were not allowed to offer singing and hostessing. If caught, Wendy could lose her residency. And like other foreign KTV hostesses, she risks deportation. But with the borders closed, foreign hostesses couldn't leave Singapore even if they wanted to. In fact, at least 16 foreign hostesses were deported following raids on KTV lounges after the COVID-19 cluster broke out. Undercover Asia follows the trail of the deported hostesses to find out how they were recruited in the first place. Working illegally on tourist visas is what most hostesses do because few legal options are available to them in Singapore. Pre-COVID, hostesses could apply for the Performing Artiste Permit. This is valid for six months and is specifically for singing and dancing. But as of July 2021, there were fewer than 50 holders of such permits in Singapore compared to the estimated 3,000 hostesses operating in KTV bars. Undercover Asia has discovered the majority of hostesses come to Singapore on short-term visit passes. This allows them to stay for 30 days, but they aren't allowed to work. So how are these girls recruited into this trade? To find out, Undercover Asia followed the trail to one source for hostesses, Vietnam. Trên mọi miền đất nước đều qua bên Singapore để làm việc theo các lời kể của các cô mà tôi tôi tiếp tiếp xúc được mà thông thường luôn luôn tiếp nối ở khu vực thành phố thành phố Hồ Chí Minh trong một số những nghề mà tôi mà tôi đã nói. Đôi khi nó có một cái câu câu chuyện rất đẹp được kể lại. Farm Trung Sen works with marginalized communities within the city. Nearly two decades ago, Singapore and Vietnam started 30-day visa-free travel. Since then, Sen's noticed an emerging trend involving young women from the Mekong Delta provinces. They come to Ho Chi Minh City before transiting on to Singapore. Ho Chi Minh's bars, massage parlors and cafes are the perfect hunting grounds for recruitment. It's here that many poor rural women will seek out work. They're usually recruited by women who once worked in Singapore as hostesses. The recruiters lure them with the promise of earning a small fortune in just 30 days. Ở thành phố Hồ Chí Minh và khi mà có một cái nhu cầu về tiền bạc cao gấp 5 hay là 10 lần thì các cô chấp nhận việc làm KTV ở bên Singapore. Và một điều nữa thì làm ở Singapore thì sẽ an an toàn về không ai biết được hơn là ở thành phố Hồ Chí Minh và có thể giấu cái nhận cái dân tính danh tính của mình khi quay về lại Việt Nam. Recruitment by former hostesses in various Asian cities helps to feed Singapore's KTVs with a constant stream of fresh-faced new girls.
Denise came to work in a bar in Ho Chi Minh in 2019. She's the main breadwinner for a family of seven and eventually traveled to Singapore to work as a hostess. She shared her story with the Singapore NGO Project X just before she was deported. I want to make enough money so that when I have children, they can go to university, have a career, and not do a dishonest job like me. I hope my parents won't have a hard time. And when my mom needs money for medical treatment, I want to be able to say, don't worry, I can help. Through face-to-face -face recruiting at bars and massage parlors in Ho Chi Minh, recruiters put the women in touch with their broker partners in Singapore. But that's now also complemented by online recruitment. That's how Denise found the broker who helped her enter Singapore. In Singapore, brokers include former Vietnamese hostesses. For between one to three thousand dollars, they provide a 30-day tourist immigration package. This includes the flight money for an airport taxi, access to a cheap place to stay in Singapore, and a $700 one-day-only cash loan. Nicholas Laneth is an expert on these transnational links. He spent a decade studying how Vietnamese sex workers and hostesses enter various Southeast Asian countries. When they arrive to Singapore, they can be asked by ICA officials to show that they have enough money. To... It can be up to $700. And if there is a suspicion, they are asked to open the luggage. So if they carry many sexy clothes, what is required to stay in Singapore for a month, that's very suspicious. They might be uh, rejected, no? So what they often do is they purchase a one-week return ticket. So they, if they are asked by ICA officer, they'll say, just come here for a week, you see my luggage, there is almost nothing. Laneth learned about the Vietnam-Singapore Broker Hostess Network after spending six months undertaking field research in Singapore in 2015. During this time, he rented a room in a Jujiet shop house with a Vietnamese mama son and her girls. I participated to all activities, going to church, going to the pagodas, helping them to send money, uh, uh, translating the messages from Vietnamese into English, teaching English also. It was during this time that Laneth discovered the tricks of this trade. He realized that the initial one to three thousand Singapore dollar immigration package fee paid by the girls would buy their membership into a discount club of sorts. So let's say that a woman purchased the package, she stays one month in Singapore, she repays after 10 days, then for 20 days and any other money she makes is her profit, she returns to Ho Chi Minh City, and three months later she returns again to Singapore, she only needs to make a phone call or send a message to the broker, hey, I need a ticket, I need a show money, and I need accommodation, and the broker will provide these, uh, these services at a, at a much lower price than the, the migration package. It will be 150 or 200 Sing dollars for the the ticket and the accommodation is always ten dollars a day. Few of these women get to play tourist, even for a day. Wendy got to know many of them during the two years she spent working as a hostess before the pandemic. <laughs> Laneth 
呃，没有人可以逼我们呢、啊。别的国家，呃，你不喜欢你要做，可是新加坡的不会嘛？你愿意你就做。Michael is married to a former hostess, and he tells us that before COVID, hostesses would, after two or three working stints on a short-term visit pass, start looking for more permanent options to work here. Maybe they have some skill like manicure, pedicure, get a work permit, come in, and then daytime they work under a company, but at night they were actually part-time. Working outside the law means that hostesses are very vulnerable. When things get out of hand inside a KTV, turning to the police for help is not an option. I have seen guys that are totally unruly and disrespectful to the hostess. Uh. The moment they come into the room, the guy would start having his hands all around the lady uh, at every possible part of the body of, of the lady. One of the things pre-pandemic that the women faced was excessive drinking. Right? They were forced to drink copious amounts of alcohol in order to hit certain quotas. To the extent that some of them might black out, some of them come to us and said, Vanessa, I don't know what happened last night, but I think a customer did something to me. Can you get me an STI check right now? I'm not sure right, if I got something. And there was no recourse that they had. Ironically, with heightened scrutiny after the COVID-19 cluster, the women are now even more vulnerable as KTVs go underground to evade the law. Underground KTVs operates in many places all around Singapore from office spaces. Residential units like your landed properties, condominiums, even HDB. The police are aware that unlicensed public entertainment outlets are operating despite COVID-19 restrictions. So after the KGB cluster, we really noticed an upsurge of raids. We see continuous raids of underground bars and clubs and karaoke joints. A lot of short-term pass holders have already been arrested and deported as a result. In this time of COVID-19, regular KTV activities like singing and hostessing are banned. But in November 2020, some KTVs reopened as F&B-only operations. Undercover Asia investigated some of these new bistro bars. We did not enter for legal reasons. But KTV regulars informed Undercover Asia that some of these bistro bars are still flouting the rules. We have our bistro, but with that, they still incorporate those elements of uh, having hostesses entertaining their patrons. Restaurants uh, that operate legally in a day, receiving customers with their doors wide open and then transiting to a night operation after hours with their front shutters down. Undercover Asia understands that demand for hostesses is still robust and far outstrips supply. This mass arrest of short-term visit pass holders left a vacuum in the industry. The demand really won't go away just because there aren't any more hostesses in Singapore. What we have observed is that there has been a slow increased number of locals 
entering into the industry. Julian is a longtime KTV regular. Since the height of the pandemic, he's noticed a shift in business operations. While some illegally operating KTV bars masquerade as bistros, others have moved into industrial and residential areas. Information on these new bars is shared via Telegram chat groups. So the moment you're in, you can see that there's over 10,000 members. All of these promotions will be posted daily on chat. Most of the promotional posters we see are pictures of alcohol. But if you see pictures of the ladies, you, you, you understand that more likely than not, uh, they will also be able to provide hostesses and explicitly mentioning you know, having many pretty waitresses uh, and then with the word private. This will be an example for a private setting KTV. In a single message from a public group chat, they have all the information that any person would need. You have the address, the rates, you can even have the nationality of the hostesses. Is it surprising to you to see them post so openly on the platform when it is still in some sense banned? I don't find it surprising. Even before COVID, these avenues of uh, discussion of such uh, sensitive topics have been around even in this period now. I don't think anything would really deter them. If a particular customer is not a regular user of the platform or a regular patron that the Mama San knows, Highly likely they will not entertain any requests from this anonymous user. You will have the authorities that are tapping on these platforms to fish out whatever that they need to know. As a user, does that worry you? Not really. No, I can remain as anonymous uh, as I can. Uh. This is just an anonymous account. Uh. If anyone were to get caught in this domain, right, they can easily just create a new user and carry on with uh, their promotions. Uh, I would During the pandemic, there have been some benefits for hostesses who continue to illegally work at pivoted bistro bars. Higher returns and better behaved clients. Wendy worked in the food service for a decade until her Singaporean husband died. She turned to hostessing in 2018 to make up for the lost income. During the pandemic, Wendy worked in a pivoted bistro bar. But fearing COVID infection, she quit after a few short months. She then returned to a different business model that has gained popularity. Hostessing one-on-one -on -one at private homes. This is known as outcall hostessing. You no longer go to the physical unit. You accept outcall services via Telegram, WeChat, friends, all kinds of uh, social media platforms. Uh. Probably the customer may have prior contacts with the mama, and then the mama would then share that, you know, I do still have my fear of girls. They are available for outcall now. You want to have fun in your own private setting? There are two tiers of outcall hostessing. The first is pure companionship. This is where a few hours of drinking costs $400. The second tier is where, beyond companionship, some hostesses offer sex as well, for an added upfront fee. This outcall model is more lucrative, but can be more dangerous for hostesses. The hostess now are venturing into unknown places of where the customer asks them to go to. They have zero protection over what happens. You know, in the KTVs, you still can run away, right? You can still shout for help. But now imagine if you're walking into the house unit of a person, she's entirely helpless. This is very dangerous uh, force of events. Uh. If a lady agrees to go, she better be damn sure that she can protect herself. Uh. Because there are no more KTVs to work at, some of these workers actually have to resort to doing full-service sex work. The problem with this is that they never anticipated to do full-service sex work, right? They might not have access to knowledge on how to negotiate condom use, right? Which then uh, is a problem for the women, but also for society and public health at large.
Since the pandemic, Vanessa Ho and her team at Project X have doubled their efforts to reach out to these women. We often think about how can we protect the businesses, but we never thought about, okay, what about the hostesses, the waitresses, how do we protect the workers? When nightlife opens again, how do we protect the workers who have been forced underground? Uncertainty remains over when KTVs will be allowed to fully reopen legally. And the future of the industry looks bleak. Can KTVs survive the pandemic? And if they do, is it time to overhaul this industry?